Hey everybody, my name is Tim Bryan. I like to make sports analytics videos. Today's video is going to be kind of an introduction to machine learning uh, through the lens of this five-year survival of NBA rookies data set. So what do I mean by that? Uh, the data set is a list of NBA rookies first year stats and then we're determining trying to determine if that NBA player is still in the league after five years just based on their first year stats. So um, we're going to be using a library called PyCarrot. Today's video is just kind of an introduction, but in the future we'll use PyCarrot to train some models. Uh, it's an extremely easy thing to learn. It's low code machine learning. We'll get more advanced, but PyCarrot, if you have basic Python skills, you'll know how to use PyCarrot. It's, it's extremely simple. Um, and I'm no means by no means an expert in machine learning. I make these videos to force myself to learn. Um, so this isn't going to be an exhaustive resource or anything, but it'll, it'll be a good introduction if you're looking for like a quick project to start learning machine learning. So let's get started. Here's a look at um, the data we're working with. So um, you can see these are mostly just standard NBA stats. We've got games played, um, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, uh, things like that, blocks, steals, average per game. Um, and then on, all the way on the right here, you can see we have a target column. So in this case, our target is yes or no, is this NBA rookie in the league after five years? And the one indicates a yes, the zero indicates a no. We're going to learn, we're going to train a model <clears throat> on how to predict from these data points whether or not the rookie is still in the league after five years. So uh, what is machine learning? And, and you know, I'm sure you see here a lot in the news now about artificial intelligence and you know, general AI, that kind of thing. But really what machine learning is, is teaching a machine to recognize patterns using statistics. It's just math, that's all it is. Um, <clears throat> there's different kinds of machine learning problems, classification, regression, clustering, time series. Uh, that's just a handful of them. But I bolded classification because that's what we're doing here. Uh, we're, this, this data set is meant for classification. So what is classification? It's teaching a machine based on the features of a data set to predict the label. So in our case, the label is yes, no. Did the rookie make it to five years in the league? The label could also be a zero or a one, uh, a yes or a no, a red or blue, cat or dog, anything like that. I've only listed um, binary classification issues here because uh, that, that's what we're doing today. It's simple, yes or no, binary. But you could have a, a multi-label classification problem where you're trying to predict from 20 different things, what is this? You know, Just based on the data, it could be 20 different things. It could be a cat, dog. Uh, a fish, a parrot, something like that. So <clears throat> classification is not limited to binary problems. Um, our features, quite simply, are the data points we're using to predict this label. So these have varying degrees of correlation to the label. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, in our case, three-point percentage, maybe that has a high correlation to whether or not the rookie is still in the league after five years. And maybe that correlation has changed over time. The NBA is more of a three-point league than ever, so perhaps uh, an 80s rookie with a high three-point percentage has less of a chance of staying in than um, so a similar player in today's game. So here's kind of a visual representation. Uh, you know, this is there's only two features here: the x and y axis, and these are this is how the machine has classified these data points. Here's my idea of what a like a machine learning process pipeline looks like. Um, you start with pre-processing the data, move on to feature engineering, train test splits. You will select a model, and PyCarrot actually makes it very easy to select a model. Uh, you with one function, you can run your data through like 20 different machine learning models. It'll tell you the most accurate one. It's pretty powerful. And then you're gonna we're gonna train the model and assess it. And I've drawn this arrow signifying that it's kind of a, <clears throat> a loop here. And that's because when you get to the end, you may find uh, I need to pre-process this differently. I need to add some more features, maybe shuffle the train test split differently. I may not like the model I've chosen. So 
it's kind of a, a, a repeating loop while you're trying to improve this model that you're building. All right, let's get into this. So <clears throat> pre-processing, everybody does it differently. It requires different, um, there's different requirements based on the data set. So this is a non-exhaustive list of example pre-processing techniques. So one of the biggest ones, the most common ones uh, is handling null values. We actually don't have to worry about this for our data set. I, I've got the data set off Kaggle.com, which has a ton of different um, machine learning data sets. And the convenient thing about that is a lot of times whoever is providing this data has cleaned it already for us. Like they've gotten rid of the null values. Um, not always, but you know, there, there's also different ways to handle null values. You could uh, <clears throat> enter in a zero for the null value. You could use the average. You know, there's a lot of different options. So um, another example of a pre-processing technique is label encoding. So <clears throat> in our case, uh, we don't have to worry about this. If you saw in the beginning, this target column here, it's one or zero, indi one indicating, yes, they're still in the league after five years. So. Uh, but you may, when, when you get your data or create your data from whatever, it may not be as clean as this, but a machine can only understand numbers. You know, if you write Python or type in a Word document, in the end, that's calculated, crunched down into ones and zeros that the computer's reading. So we need to convert these labels to ones or zeros. That's what label encoding is. Next, um, normalization. So uh, we've got all these all these numbers, which uh, like, for example, three point percentage, that's on a percentage scale out of 100. <clears throat> and then we've got data points like average minutes played. These are totally different scales. So obviously three point percentage is on a percentage scale. Average minutes played is just a number. So what normalization does is it puts all of these different um, ranges of numbers in our features on the same scale. Um, this may or may not help our model learn better, but you know, if you've got <clears throat> wildly different scales, sometimes it can throw the model off. Because to the model, these aren't these aren't three point percentage numbers. These are just numbers. You know, they don't uh, machines don't understand what they're looking at, at least not yet. So sometimes normalization can help. Um, collinearity, handling collinearity. This is kind of a more complicated thing to grasp, but we may have features that influence themselves. So um, this could be hurting, hurting the model's ability to learn if there's collinearity between the features. Um, so from the lens of our NBA problem here, uh, if someone has a lot of offensive rebounds, um, chances are they're gonna have a lot of defensive rebounds. So these are highly correlated. Uh, you know, it, this may or may not help the model's learning. So we might not wanna even bother handling this. Uh, it's kind of ambiguous in, in this case. Um, but what I will say is, you know, for example, if you were working for a bank, deciding on whether or not to give someone a credit card, and you were looking at their balances month over month, and each month was a feature, January, February, March, those are features, the balances for each of those months. Um, obviously, your January balance is going to affect your February balance and so on. So that would be a case where you want to remove the collinearity and, and handle for that. So, you know, that's kind of a complicated thing, but but we can get more into it later. Um, <clears throat> Pre-processing, I'll say, is probably the most important step. It's also the most difficult to get right. Um, you know, everybody does it differently, and you're probably going to do it five or six times before you get it right. So, feature engineering. This is just generating new features from our existing data set. So this can improve the model of learning. Um, these are, these are kind of terms that I've thought of just from my experience with machine learning, but. You've got internal feature engineering. So uh, for example, we've got three pointers per game and we've got total games played. If we multiply those together, we can get total three pointers for that season. So <clears throat> perhaps total three pointers correlates highly to staying in the league more so than three pointers per game, something like that. Um, so that'd be an example of using math to create new features from our existing data. Um, next, you got ex external feature engineering, which would be um, we don't actually have it in this data set, but if we had player name or player ID, we could connect to basketballreference.com and get maybe their height and their weight, add that to our data set, and maybe those features would tell us a little bit more about whether or not this player is going to stay in the league. All right, 
once we've pre-processed, we've added any new features we want to, um, we need to split the data into training and testing. So training data is splitting the data. Uh, you know, usually the general split is 80-20. Um, 80%, we train it on, use it, use these advanced statistical machine learning methods to find out the patterns. And then, you know, it's got it's got kind of a, a concept of these patterns. And then we test it on that last 20% to see how accurate it is. And there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can change the way you split it. So you could do 50, 50, 70, 30, something like that. Um, yeah, so there's also methods like shuffling. So you can move the order of the rows around, reshuffle. Um, you can do different kinds of folds. So this would be iterating through different train test combinations. Um, these are all things we'll get into later. I've just listed a couple of uh, machine learning models that I know of. Um, you know, it's not required that you understand the underlying math behind these, but it may help you uh, learn faster. So these are just some words you could look up. All right. Last but not least, probably the most important part is assessing your model after you've trained it. So um, <clears throat> these are a couple of different ways to assess it. O overall accuracy, how accurate was it? The, the correct percentage uh, over total observations. That's one way. Uh, it may not necessarily be the best way. Uh, for example, precision, how many positive IDs were correct? So if the model says, yes, this player stayed in the league for five years, uh, how many of those were correct? And then you've got something like recall, which is how many true positives were ID'd. So, uh, you know, how many players that actually did stay in the league after five years were missed by the model? Um, and the, the when you want to look at precision of recall is something like if you have a very high leverage situation, like say you're training a model on identifying a cancerous tumor you would want high precision in there because you'd rather have a false positive than miss a true positive, if that makes sense. So for a model like that, you'd want to optimize for precision and recall doesn't matter as much. Uh, I'm sorry, you would want to optimize for recall because true positives are what you're looking for. So um, false positives are less detrimental in that case. Uh, deeper knowledge here, if you want to look up F1 score or Matthews correlation coefficient, these are other metrics to assess your model's ability. Um, you know, they're, they're a little more complicated, but a lot of people swear by these metrics when you're assessing a machine learning model. So, and I've just got some charts here. I think the most helpful one right now, at least, is probably this confusion matrix. So we can see um, a zero would be what the, on this side is what the model's predicting. So up here, zero uh, was predicted and zero was the actual class. So these are the true negatives, um, one and one. These are the true positives. And then this would be, it predicted a zero, but it was a one. That's a false negative. Uh, it was a one and it predicted zero. That's a false positive. Did I mix those up? It was it predicted zero and it was one. That's a false negative predicted one and it was zero. That's a false positive. So what I'd like, if you're following along with me on this, I would like everybody to download Anaconda. Um, it's kind of a Python virtual environment. So uh, if you're not familiar with the virtual environments, you download things on your computer, Python packages, those kinds of things, <clears throat> right to your computer. But we're gonna use this library called PyCarrot and it's going to, if you download it right on your machine, it's going to mess everything up that you've ever done, like Python wise. So what you need to do is download Anaconda and then create a new environment using this top right um, command here. I'm not sure if everybody can see that. But uh, anyway, I'll, I'll post it uh, online. But you want to create a new virtual environment <clears throat> and name it PyCarrot and then install PyCarrot in that environment so that it can choose whatever version of NumPy or whatever it needs. So, all right, and then here, here's some sources. Um, I will post this PowerPoint somewhere for everybody's download uh, wants and needs. Um, and then next video, we'll get into the code and start training this model. Um, 
I guess that's that's about it. Uh, I have a Discord with like five people in it that um, will ask about code and stuff like that. So I'll post a link to that as well. So thanks for listening.